This is an interview about a newly introduced Kessler Cine Shooter with Eric Kessler. This is a Cinedy Gear News video. Hi guys, this is Cinedy, my name is Nino, and today it is my pleasure to talk to Eric Kessler, the CEO of Kessler in Indiana, US. How are you, Eric? I'm doing well. Hello. That's really great to hear, Eric. Now we're here today to talk about the newly announced Kessler Cine Shooter. It's a completely new product that you recently announced and that is now entering the market. What can you tell me about it? Yeah, I mean, we when we came up with this product, we saw that there was a big gap between the second shooter and the Cine Drive system. And um, you know, this the second shooter was intended to be you know more affordable, general application interviews, uh, basic time lapse, um, you know some simple stop motion kind of device that was affordable, easy to set up, uh, more for run and gun applications, moving, you know, it, <clears throat> moving quickly and making it uh, more of a portable type device. CineDrive was a very high-end studio-based device uh, doing high-end uh, visual effects, ultra high precision. You know, unfortunately with that comes a price tag and is also longer to set up and um, a lot heavier. Uh, so what we wanted to come up with was a device that kind of, you know, fit in between the two. So affordability, uh, lightweight, uh, a lot of function, and uh, a high level of precision. Uh, and so we kind of married the two systems. The format, you know, being a nodal head, uh, we borrowed from the CineDrive system. Uh, and then a lot of the components, uh, the main driver system inside is based off of the second shooter platform uh, with a secondary control board that offers a lot more uh, resource as far as memory and expandability. Uh, so inside does live one uh, second shooter pro board and then there's a new board that we nickname in house as a backpack which has the basically the bigger brains uh, that puts it closer to on par with the CineDrive system and also has some peripherals in it that CineDrive doesn't even have uh, with the RS-232, UART, um, and a couple other peripherals that allow us to connect to Dragon Frame, the inertia wheels, and a lot of other third-party uh, uh, devices, uh, making it extremely flexible. And you know we came in right at five pounds, so very lightweight, easy to set up, uh, so it has the run and gun uh, capabilities and the lightweight uh, chassis, I guess, if you will, uh, to make it easily portable and has the power of CineDrive as far as uh, the precision, uh, the, the nodal uh, you know, format and um, the capabilities of the chaos software and expandability into third party uh, uh, peripherals. Very cool. So it is a very complex system. It's a complex motion control system, kind of, in a. But it's it's possible to operate it much simpler than the Cine Drive, right? Well, it's about the same. I mean, if you're using the Chaos software, it's going to be the same as Cine Drive. But we also have the iPhone and the Android apps, which are kind of a simplified version of Chaos. Uh, it doesn't have near the capabilities, but you can set up to ten keyframes uh, and do a lot of. Uh, adjustment very quickly and very simply. So if you're just doing in, uh, interviews or just simple time lapses or stop motion, you'd probably want to use the app, uh, the iPhone or Android app, uh, remote app is what we're calling it, uh, just for fast, easy, simple setups. If you're getting into more complex moves, what, we have the Chaos software for the Cine Shooter, uh, and we did an upgrade on it where now you can have up to 20 keyframes per axis. Um, so it gives you a lot of power as far as creating very complex moves. And there's all kinds of things you can do in Chaos, like the event mode, which is where you can, uh, can uh, record tiles on a screen that are uh, positions. Let's say if you're shooting a live event, you could have wide center stage, tight center stage, drummer tight, t drummer wide, um, and so on and so forth, and just call those up by pressing the buttons that you create. And then you can also create moves and switch between them. We also have our gigapixel function in chaos. We have uh, high level uh, stop motion, time lapse uh, capabilities. Uh, so it's almost endless, and we're going to continue to build on that platform. So we have a pretty big uh, whiteboard list of things that we want to do throughout this year. So that software is going to continue to get more and more powerful as time goes on. 
So it is a complex system, but if you had to explain what uh, what it does to your mom, how would you explain it? You know, somebody has no clue about motion control kind of stuff. What, what can sure, you do? Yes. What can you do with it? Okay. Well, I mean, you can you program it extremely simply. There are onboard controls. So should your PS4 controller, your phone, you know, goes dead, your phone goes dead, you don't have a computer or a tablet to run the Chaos software. There is a joystick on the head itself and you can do in-head programming just by positioning the head through any one of our interfaces uh, to a particular position. You hit record keyframe, it remembers that position. You move to the second position, third, fourth, and so on, uh, recording those key points or those key frames that you want. And then when you're ready, you just decide how you want to play it back, whether it's live motion, time lapse, or stop motion. And then you basically just say, I want you know, to go from keyframe one to your end keyframe, I want it to take 30 seconds, a minute, 10 minutes. Uh, if you're doing time lapse, you might say a few hours and I want to take 700 photos. And you just plug uh, the trigger camera in, or the camera trigger into the camera and it will do the rest of the work for you. So the head can control five axes, uh, three of those, uh, I think three additional axes actually on top of those five are, are available with the expansion module. Um, how does the wireless expansion module work and, and what motors can be used? Sure. Um, well, let me make a quick correction. It's actually two axes per expansion module, um, not three. So uh, the way that it works is uh, it's basically that backpack board that I'm speaking of that's inside the cine shooter head. Um, it's just that board housed in its own device uh, or its own case. And it will wirelessly connect to the head or you can go on a wired connection should you be in a noisy environment where you're getting too much uh, Wi-Fi interference. Um, and basically just it just acts as an expansion. Uh, it just adds two additional access per unit. Um, we're expecting to be able to add two of those at least to one head, which would give you the available of nine access system and potentially more. We just haven't dug into that yet. We're just trying to uh, get the current platform or goals that we set out met and then we'll start looking at how, for, how much further we can expand the system. So 10 keyframes can be programmed directly onto the head, I think. Is it possible to ease these keyframes? keyframes? Yes, yes. So in the head, uh, it's a much more simplified than using the app where you can control the Bezier curves to do that and have a visual representation of what you're doing. In head, um, the way that you would do it is once you uh, create your keyframes, uh, we have a uh, ramping feature, which is a global feature. So you can't adjust in head individual keyframes, the ramp in, ramp out, but it will be a global setting to where you can set, I want a 50% ramp in and out of every keyframe or 20% or nothing if you want it to be more robotic, or you can go up to 100%, uh, which is gonna be extremely smooth coming into each keyframe and coming out of each keyframe. Uh, in terms of, I mean, I, I use MoCo systems often to shoot people with sound and, and uh, as I mentioned, interviews. Uh, sometimes, of course, there are issues uh, with motors being noisy. Uh, is there a way to, you know, make it as silent as possible to actually shoot an interview with it? Yes. Um, the standard setup when you get the head is in the what we call our normal mode, um, which limits its speed. It's still fast, uh, but it's not in the high speed mode. It's completely silent. I mean, you literally have to put your ear right up to it to hear anything, and even that is difficult to hear. Um, if you put it into high speed mode, which we can do, I believe it's one revolution in a second or 1.2 seconds. I don't remember the exact spec. It's fast. It's blazing fast. Um, at that point, you will hear motor noise because the motors are revving up to over 10,000 RPM. Uh, in standard mode, we, we cap that RPM off to about 4,000 RPM, which at that speed, they're running quietly enough that you cannot hear them. That's really great to hear because I think a lot of other manufacturers you know, kind of avoid the question, at least in the past. They were like, ah, yeah, you can use it for interviews, but, you know. And um, in reality, very often, other systems were too loud in my experience. And I think the second shooter was... Okay, uh, it could have been a little bit quieter, but I think the, uh, it, of course, always depending on the motor you're using. Uh, but it's great to hear that right. with the cine shooter, you can actually not hear it if you put it in the slow mode or in the, the normal yeah. mode. And the way that we were able to achieve that was by switching the gearing around where most of the noise comes from isn't the actual electronic part of the motor, it's the gearbox that's actually attached to the motor. And so what we did in this system was we reversed how we did our gearing. So the actual gearbox on the motor itself is only a 27 to one. Uh, as to where in the second shooter, it's 500 to one, which means the motor has to rev up, which means those internal gears are spinning at a tremendous speed just to have a decent output speed. 
as to where with a 27 to one ratio coming off of the motor, the motor's barely moving at all to put out a high amount of output speed. And then through the belt drive system internally, which makes no noise at all, we then get our torque by increasing the ratio from there on out, or you know, from the motor shaft to the output shaft or the camera platform or the pan. That's great. Now it's really great to hear because that will make a lot of difference for a lot of people I know. Um, in the Chaos software, is the Chaos software updated to work with new operating systems and especially new hardware like the new M1 Max that are becoming very popular? Yep, we just bought our engineers for those M1s, and so everything's being tested on that platform. And like I said, we're hope we're still shooting for Friday for a release. If not, it'll be early next uh, next week. Perfect. Um, you also have a facial tracking feature for uh, mobile phones, or it works on mobile phones. How does that work? Um, well, it's using the Apple API of the facial tracking that they already have installed in their Apple toolbox. Uh, we're just using that to uh, move motors. Um, if you can imagine, uh, if you've ever used facial tracking uh, with an iPhone, it's basically a box that recognizes a face and as it moves around the screen, just picture that as being a virtual joystick. So once you say where you want to keep that, uh, the composition of that box in relative to the frame, uh, you lock that in and as it starts to want to move out of that designated zone, it will move the motors to make sure that that box stays in that area. So it will track that face. Very cool. Um, let's before we move on to talking about pricing and availability, uh, just maybe you can tell me a little bit about the manufacturing. I think you guys make your products 100% uh, in the US, right? That is correct, yes. Uh, other than some electronic components that are purchased from outside of the US, but all of these uh, the circuit boards are built here in the US, assembled here in the US, um, matter of fact, here in Indiana. Uh, the, 100% of the design is done in south and in-house, um, and then we subcontract the circuit boards to be made just down the road, about 45 minutes away. Uh, those are brought in. All the machine parts are made in-house. We have a full machine shop here, um, and we do all the assembly in-house. About the only thing that we sub out is soft goods like cases and that type of thing. Uh, stickers obviously are uh, also made here in Indiana. Uh, all the labeling and uh, the boxes are made here in Indiana as well. Uh, so all the packaging is here. Uh, yeah, we try to keep as much local as possible. That's brilliant, especially in times like these. Uh, I think when you know the world is changing quickly with COVID and everything political going on. So I think you guys do great by you know utilizing the mobile, like the local workforce and people and companies around you because that's that's where everything is going. You know, like think global but act local. I think is a is a good thing. <laughs> It is, and, and the benefit for us and for our customers is the, the ability to react to changes very quickly. Uh, if, if we find out that there's a, a need for, a, let's say, a different tapped hole, or we find out our shipping boxes are getting damaged, we can, you know, in a short drive, go over and work with their engineers to change that on the fly. Um, as well as supply chain issues, we don't have that by ordering overseas, long ship times. Uh, you know, a lot of companies I've worked for in the past that would deal with overseas companies, you have to buy a large quantity and long lead times. And then when you get it, if it's wrong, there's no way to quickly correct that mistake. Um, so it can really hinder a company um, as far as being able to produce quickly. Um, quality control, another thing, you know, the parts are made literally probably within 100 feet from where they're final assembled. So as an assembler is putting something together, if there's a problem found in that batch, the machine can be stopped instantly and corrected. Uh, with minimal amount of loss. Uh, so there's all kinds of benefits to doing as much things under one roof. We have a 64,000 square foot facility here with a lot of capabilities and um, it allows us to react more quickly to you know, problems or improvements uh, that are needed. Do you, uh, just a, a personal question, do you miss trade shows? Uh, yes and no. Uh, being on the floor the first year when we did NAB was exciting and fun. The second year was okay. After that, um, you know, standing for three to four days, uh, basically answering the same questions over and over again gets a little, a little tiresome at times. I mean, I don't hate it, but it does wear on you a bit. Uh, but what I do love about it is seeing all the people that I've made friends with and also making new friends. Um, with people, I mean, the, the people are what makes makes it good, you know. Um, 
Just a long, tired day, a lot of setup, a lot of pre-prep. I mean, it's, you know, usually six weeks in advance, you know, all hands on deck. Everybody's pulling their hair out, trying to get ready for the show. There's always problems, shipping delays, anything you can think of, it almost always goes wrong. And trying to pull all this together is a highly stressful environment for many, many weeks and not a lot of sleep. So that aspect of it, I don't miss it at all. Um, really the only thing that I do miss is the interaction with people, hearing about stories about how they're using our gear and uh, making new friendships. Absolutely, I completely agree with you. The one thing that you can't replicate online is the interaction and the hands-on aspect of w with the gear as well and, and just meeting people and 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 that's yeah it's just not i mean i've i've I tried to follow the virtual ces this year and you know it was it's just a bunch of press conferences yeah. uh, after another and i was really surprised that they didn't do a better job at you know adding some kind of interactive even if it was just a chat or something where people would really engage in but i don't know it doesn't seem to be possible and i think everybody's getting you know frustrated right now because you can't meet of course but you can't actually also try out the new gear um, and of course if you want to put your money on something more expensive you you want to try it out again so i hope that will change soon yeah yeah i do too all right so let's talk about pricing and availability how much is the cine shooter and when and where can people buy it uh, the Sunny Shooter is $2,800. Uh, they can buy it now. We just released our next batch. Uh, these are not beta. These are uh, proven production, I'm sorry, yeah, produ proven production units now. So we did that early beta release of 50 units. I'm happy we did it that way. Uh, as with any new product, you know, we did extensive testing in-house, but in-field testing is uh, always the absolute best. And we found out that um, as going through some of our features, like the smart handle, um, through our initial testing, it was working, but we found a better way to do it that was working even better, which required a board change. I th think when we found that out, we only had like seven or eight units in the field. So it was very easy for us to get those units back and upgrade them to the new circuit board. We also did a bearing change. Um, we came up with a better idea. Um, it wasn't, the ones that originally went out were okay, um, but we found out how to put a different bearing system in there that not only sped up manufacturing and made it easier for our assemblers, but also a smoother, quieter, not that there was really that much of a problem with the first ones, but it was an improvement in many different ways for making that mechanical change. Um, and I think there was a couple other small things that, again, it was mostly, uh, changing for manufacturing just to make it simpler and easier um, you know so there's that form of testing of you know when you're building prototypes you don't really think about that when you have 50 units to build inside of a week um, you start finding out a lot of little things that are problematic as far as you know how do you get this part to fit in here because it's one thing on a computer it's one thing in the lab it's another thing on the assembly line so we changed some things for the for more on the assembly side and then also increasing the um, the quality of the uh, output of the motion and also allowing more features to be possible in the future. So now we have it pretty much locked in. It's a pretty powerful system. We can't think of anything else that we'd want to do with it that it's not capable of doing. Amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time, Eric. All right. Thank you, Nino. It's always great talking with you. Likewise. Um, and thanks everybody for watching. Stay tuned to CineD for more gear news videos and of course reviews of cameras and camera accessories and lenses and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and stay tuned to CineD.com. Thanks for watching.